2019. You know, the last couple of weeks have been a very interesting topic for us. And it's one that I'm still unpacking and allowing to impact me. The 12 disciples were front row for the most exciting time in the history of humanity. They witnessed things that you can only see in a good sci-fi movie, and they had front row seats to it. There are even two of them, the Sons of Thunder, if you guys remember who they went to do a little outreach and the town turned them away. And they came back and said, hey, Lord, with your permission, of course, let us call down fire and consume that whole town. <laughs> and the Lord said, whoa, 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 God, you, you guys don't know what spirit you're from. But the fact that they actually thought they could do that, what kind of meetings were they used to having? But the Lord told them to do something. And their response was this. Lord, increase our faith. When they thought they were going to call down fire, they didn't say, Lord, increase our faith. When he told them to go into the cities around him and heal the sick, they did not say, Lord, increase our faith. When he says, you go raise the dead, they did not say, Lord, increase our faith. When he said, go cleanse the leper lepers, they didn't say, Lord, increase our faith. When did they say, Lord, increase our faith? He says, if your brother sins against you seven times in a day and comes back seven times, you forgive him. And they said, Lord, increase our faith. Why? You know, calling down fire from heaven, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, cleansing lepers, all of that external. But to forgive, that's internal. Lord, you got to increase my faith. And just quickly, what is it? And again, I will say that he, he, he directed it directly at my center when he said, unless you forgive America, you will be stuck where you are. Unless you forgive, you'll just be stuck right where you are. So forgiveness is the key. Lord, increase our faith. Unforgiveness is like eating out of a dirty pan. So what we're going to talk about today is living our best life. Anybody here excited to live their best life? Yes. Woohoo! Yes. I want to live the good life. Give me I'm, lifestyles of the rich and famous. That's, that's not exactly what I'm talking Oh, look. Who's up? Who's, somebody's over there. Oh, yes, yeah. Preach it. Preach it. In order to live our best life, in order to make this legal and to hit the checkbox, I do have to read a scripture, right? right. <laughs> oh, we are a word of faith church. We read scriptures every Sunday. Let's, let's, let's look at something in Leviticus. And so look there first. We're gonna, I know this one's small because there's a lot of words up there, and I apologize. But he says, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits. Everybody say first fruits. First fruits. It's going to be very important. First fruits of your harvest to the priest. Uh, skip down the verse to chapter 27 and verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. The first fruits is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all of your increase so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. In the new, in, I'm sorry, in the Passion Translation, it says, Glorify God with all your wealth, honoring him with your very best, with every increase that comes to you, then every dimension of your life will overflow with blessings from an uncontainable source, source of inner joy. 
I just, I enjoy, I'm telling you, I'm just loving that Passion Translation more than this. But one of the key things that has come out in the past couple of weeks. Okay, let me, let me back up. <sighs> Who wrote the Old Testament? I heard it over here. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit influenced, nudged, coerced the men of God to write down the thoughts of God. The Holy Spirit. Okay. Who overshadowed Mary to give birth to the word the very same Holy Spirit when Jesus was baptized who came down on him in the form or as a dove and remained the very same Holy Spirit who basically wore the Jesus suit like a glove and went about preaching teaching here the same Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit and the Father are one. Father and the Holy Spirit are one. Father and Son are one. It's the Holy Spirit. Huh. Jesus, in a talk with his disciples, said, if you don't understand this parable, how then will you understand all parables? Remember that two weeks ago? What was the key to the parable? What was the key to the parable? The sower sows the word. Is it possible that that same ideology is what he was transferring to us through the old scriptures? Is that possible? Well, if the sower sows the word, how many of you tithe your words? And if you say yes, think about this. When I say tithe your words, the average person may say four to 5,000 words a day. Are four to 500 of your words magnifying the Lord? The Lord is saying for you and I to walk into what we're supposed to be, we need to give the first fruits of uh, this, this thing to him. We need to tithe it to him. All throughout scripture, when you read scripture with that mindset that the sower sows the word. Hmm. Isaac sowed in a famine and reached a, hun reaped a hundredfold return. If the, if the model is the sower sows the word. When the famine in your life comes, do you sow the word? And the model says you'll reach, reap a hundredfold return. Do you sow the word? What is the famine? It could be a bad diagnosis. It could be a bounced check, which leads you to believe, oh, my God, if I'm bouncing checks now, things ain't going to get no better. When the famine comes, do you sow the word? I have an abundance. I have no lack. My God supplies all my need according to his riches and glory. I don't care what the doctor's report says. I am healed by his stripes. Do you sow the word? Do you tithe your words? Let me say this. The more of a storehouse that you build up of seed sown out of your mouth, the faster the harvest will start to come. Yeah, I, I thought that was the look I was going to get. Check again. Maybe it's just cancer. <laughs> Living our 
best life. How many people want to live their best life? Well, if you want to live your best life, one of the things that I have in my life is I have a father who I can honestly say I truly try to emulate. I mean, in the physical, I, the, Lord, the Lord gave me the best. I mean, I, I can't. And listen, if, if, you, if, you, if you didn't grow up with two loving parents, my heart goes out to you. Um, that just wasn't my reality. My father and my mother were such a loving couple who, who brought forth probably the coolest young man that the world has ever seen. <laughs> Preach it, Justin. But the Lord gave me such examples to follow in a, in a, in a loving father. And one of the things that is so cool, like I, I have such certain images that I grew up with. Uh, for example, I, I grew up with a father who washed dishes and who, who cleaned laundry. So when I do it at home, I mean, I, I look at my wife and say, hey, I live here too. Right? I mean, the dishes aren't just yours to wash. I grew up with a father who cooked. Now, I do try my best. I add heat to certain things. And, <laughs> right? And, and then I, I'll clean the dishes afterwards. Right? Because that, that is the image that I saw. If I'm going to live my best life, I need an image to follow. And God said, man, be in my image and after my likeness. What was the image that the Godhead had when they said, man, be? The image they had was Jesus. That was the image. Which means Adam was supposed to be like Jesus. But he screwed up. Don't worry. The father did not throw away the blueprints. As a matter of fact, he just rolled up his sleeves and said, okay, I'm coming. <laughs> I'm going to show you what man B is supposed to look like. So if we're going to live our best life, we need something to look at. All right. This is going to seem like I'm bouncing around. I promise I'll tie it up. Ephesians 5.18 says, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and singing and making melody in your heart. Why did he say do that? Do you know if you do that, you're starting to tithe? You're starting to tithe your work? Or you're working on that 10%? And I truly believe some of us in this church, I'm not one of them, but I believe some of us in this church, I, just my mind is, is Minister Bonnie, is that it's probably more than 10% of her words are in that direction. And again, I, I know there's probably some of you out there, I, I, would, I, I think Brother Alvin probably falls into that as well, just, just more than 10%, because when he's here working on the ground, guess what he's doing? He's praying in the Spirit, he's meditating, he's, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Singing to yourself, speaking to one another, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. When we follow the blueprint, you don't have to make that declaration, maybe it's just cancer. Right? You don't have to say maybe he's just talking about money. No, he's talking about your words. And if you follow the blueprint, you'll fulfill the blueprint. Jesus would separate himself often. And what would he do? I think this is what he was doing. I remember I asked the Lord once. I said, you know, so often you see Jesus move away from people. He'd go up on the mountain. I said, what was he praying? And the word that came back to me immediately was, just go through the Psalms. Go through the Psalms. He was sowing back to the Father his own word. Hey, this life ain't, this life is not that difficult. You just have to follow the blueprint. One of the things um, we had at the Naval Academy was this thick thing called the midshipman regulation, or mid-regs, right? And if you followed that to the T, you know, there was still manufactured stress at the Academy, but you'd make it through with no problem. Probably I mean, nobody ever read that thing. As a matter of fact, I looked at it and said, no, I ain't doing all that. Therefore, I went through there with a lot of stress. 
If you follow the blueprint, your life will be less stressful. And even when stress comes, even when, when the devil rears his ugly head, you don't even worry about it. Speaking to each other, psalms, hymns, spiritual, that is what we were doing in here last night. One of the reasons I sleep with, with praise music going all the time, or either praise music or, or a teaching going all the time, is just, I want that to affect my dreams. I want to live in a state of constant praise. Let the word of God, or, or Christ, dwell in you richly. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. If you do that, once, you know, um, when the, the father who had the, the son who was epileptic and you know, the demon was trying to, to kill him, threw him in the fire a lot, the disciples couldn't heal him, and Jesus says, this kind only go out through much prayer and fasting. When, and fasting was added. It was much prayer was in the original text. Jesus healed him, but it doesn't say that Jesus prayed. That's because Jesus always did this, and he had so much prayer in the prayer bank that when it came time to execute, the only thing he had to do was make a withdrawal. Because let me tell you, when is the best time to pray? When is the best time to read the word? It is when everything is going all right in your life. Because when stuff hits the fan, I have to monitor myself. When stuff hits the fan, it, you don't want to be in a panic trying to get it in. <laughs> and so, and so she said, oh, no, it won't work. It, and I wasn't going to say that, but. I don't want to cramp anybody's faith. But I will say it will be very difficult for it to work. You're going to have to put out at least twice the effort. But if everything is going all right in your life right now, load up on prayer. Load up on singing these songs. Load up. Put it in the bank. Put it in the bank. Okay. Because... There's coming a day when the reaper will overtake the one sowing seeds. So you're going to still be sowing a seed, and your harvesters are right on your heels. Sowing seed. The sower sows what? The harvester is coming to reap the things that you've already spoken. Have you spoken any, let me, let me ask this question, and I don't, want, I, I don't want to put anyone under any kind of condemnation, all right? Because there's absolutely nothing that you have done in life that the blood can't change and that he didn't have a blueprint for you to get out of and go do, Amen. okay? Amen. My question is, are you saying over your life what you want? in accordance with the word, or are you saying over your life what you have? If you're saying what you have, you will always have what you say. But the sower in life sows the word. That's one of the, uh, that, uh, that is such a key, key ingredient to this life called Christianity. The sower shows the word. Mm. <laughs> Living our best life. If you had to describe Jesus in, or Jesus' life in one word, what word would you choose? Now, there, Grant, there's so much. Let's see, Jesus was obedient. 
He lived a life of power. He was perfect in love. But the word I would choose, he lived a life of faith. Jesus lived a life of faith. Is there anywhere in the, in the Gospels where it says that Jesus pleased the Father? Hebrews 11, 6 says, and without faith, living within us. And I put this up in the Passion Translation. In the King James, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. I like the Passion because it says, without faith, living within you. Faith is alive? Without faith living within you, it is impossible to please the Lord. That's why I can say Jesus lived a life of faith. Because everything he did pleased the Father. Absolutely everything he did pleased the Father. Sir? He said so. And you know what? I take his said so with a more substance than with the said so of John. Did you know that John was the disciple that Jesus loved? Well, it's in John's gospel. <laughs> of course he's going to say that. <laughs> uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they didn't say that. <laughs> and I believe John. I believe John. But the Father, Jesus said, I always do what pleases my Father. What pleases my Father? It's impossible to please him without faith. If you and I are going to live our best life, how are we going to do it? I'm going to tell you, it's going to be by faith. It, could it be possible that it pleases the Father when you do something impossible? When you do something that the world says can't be done? Is it possible? And in order to do that, you need faith? Because quite frankly, the faith life should be the normal life. Right? Right? It should be normal. That when you walk in the room, sickness and disease flees. That when you come into a company that is going downhill and is about to declare bankruptcy because you have the blessing on you, you're living that life of faith that they, it just turns around. Why? Because the blessing is with you. It's funny, when it, wherever where Jacob went, he found water, right? He hit a spring here, they come chase him away, he'd go over there and hit another spring. They'd chase him away, he'd come over there and hit another spring. And then they say, oh, whoa, whoa, why don't you just dwell with us? That's supposed to be your life. That's supposed to be my life. And listen, I'm, I'm, I, I am in no way saying... I'm in no way saying that, uh, that everything in your life will be uh, gumdrops and lollipops. <laughs> However, it could be living a life of faith. There is a, a phrase that Jesus used over 60 times in Matthew, Luke, and John. And only, it only, I think, appears like once in Mark. Uh, there's reasons for that, but. Speaking of this life of faith, Jesus said this a lot. My father. My father. My father in me does the work. Me and my father are one. My Jesus was ever conscious of his relationship with the father because of his faith. If you and I are going to be and live our best lives, we're going to have to have this attitude come over, specifically come out of our mouth a lot. My father. My father. <laughs> Do you believe that I am in the father? In the father in me, the words that I speak, I do not speak on my own. But is the father within me? He does the work. He says the father within me that does the work. But in another section, Jesus says, I will come and heal him. He didn't say the father was going to heal him. He said, I'm going to come and heal him. Why? Because me and the father are one. You know when you show up on the scene, a lot of times people don't see God, they see you. 
And a lot of times, what Jesus told us to do, he says, you do it. He didn't say you pray it. You do it. Why? Because you and Jesus are one. Jesus and the Father are one, which actually means you and the Father are one. That's just, that is just the way it is. It is not blasphemous. It is you attaining to what was the original design and carrying out what was the original plan. And say it, my father, my father, my father. You know, as a kid, I grew up, I said, my daddy going to get you. And my, my, that's because I had faith that my father always had my back. My, hey, Herbert, Herbert always had my back. Now, he tore my butt up if I was wrong, but he had my back. <laughs> he had this phrase, boy, I'm going to whoop your butt, to the, your butt till it wrote like okra. I still don't know to this day what that means. Anybody ever seen okra? Yep. You know what okra is? He said, I'm going to whoop your butt till it wrote like okra. I have, I get, what does that mean? I can tell you, I experienced it. <laughs> and without faith living within us, it will be impossible to please God. <laughs> Hebrews 11.3 says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So, Jesus all, always did that which was pleasing to his father. If the worlds were framed by the word of God, what about the world that Jesus lived in? There in Jerusalem, there in Judea. Was that framed by his own words? He was just following the pattern. He spoke out what he needed. Well, if Jesus did that, and you are not above your master, you need to do that. You need to speak out what you need. And let me just say that you're not, one of the knocks against the word of faith is that we are that blab it, grab it group. We're that name it, claim it group. Let me just say, you can't name anything and claim anything that you can't find in the Bible. But if you can find it, every promise in him is yes and amen. But if you can find it, in order to find it, you got to read it. And the cool thing is when you read it, the Holy Spirit will bring it back to you. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit has brought some stuff to me before. How is it that a young man there were 71 people in my high school class 71 there were more people at my nephew's graduation from um, a Lake Braddock High School there were more people in his high school class than were in Aliceville Elementary, Aliceville Middle and Aliceville High School and then we loop in Carrollton. So Carrollton Elementary, Carrollton Middle, and Car there were more people in his high school class than were in two cities' classes where I grew up. How is it then that the Lord allowed a little boy from Podunk, Alabama, to go to the United States Naval Academy? And I'm telling you, it all had to do with the words that I was speaking. And I had no idea what I was doing, but I was saying, I'm going. I'm going. So much so that you're going to think this is stupid. You know how many colleges I applied to? One. I applied only to the United States Naval Academy. There was no plan B. Listen, I, I am in no, mean, I'm no means telling you to do that. <laughs> but you can <laughs> but you can without faith living within us it, it, what is so cool about that, that that we know that by faith the worlds were framed by, and that, that we can frame our own worlds if we can frame our own worlds and Jesus framed his own world 
can't we also defend our own world the way Jesus did? Jesus said this, away with you, Satan. I am. He basically said, I'm done with you. You are dismissed. And you know what the devil did? He packed his stuff and left. <laughs> How many people in this congregation, unfortunately, have allowed the devil to stay around for so long that you don't even believe it in your heart when you tell him to go? I'm not asking for a faith confession. What I'm asking for you to do is just to look at your life through a real lens. Because it is not the word that doesn't work. But it's our expectation and faith in the word. And sometimes we've let the devil hang around for so long that you're used to him being there. And he can be like a puppy. He said, now go back in the house. And he's just wagging his tail. Follow you. Go back in the house. But my prayer is that the Holy Spirit on the inside of you will get angry. Amen. And you say, now go on, get! Amen. Because when you say it and you mean it, him will go on and get. So Jesus lived a life of faith. And he also lived a life of forgiveness. I'm telling you, if we're going to live our best lives, we're going to have to do it by faith, and we're going to have to do it with completely forgiving hearts. Amen. We can't hold any grudges. Amen. Oh, boy. Now, you might say, you know, you know, Pastor, you don't know what I have been through. You don't know what he or she has done to me. You don't know what, you're right, I don't know. And I will never profess to know what got you from point A to point B. I will never profess to know that. I may have sympathy and empathy for it. I may even have a word of knowledge that I don't know as a word of knowledge. But I don't know. But I'm going to tell you something else. Jesus knows. Let me tell you how I know that he knows because this after these things Jesus walked in Galilee for he did not want to walk in Judea why because the Jews sought to kill him there so it says that the Jews want to kill Jesus where in Judea first three says this his brothers therefore told him why don't you go to Judea that is cold ain't it <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> I know I skipped a verse in there um, but I think all of that is related the Jews why did the Jews want to kill him? Why did they, so that's John 7. What, anybody remember what happens in John 6? In John 6, Jesus says, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And at that point, a lot of people that had been following him around said, whoa. <laughs> this dude. Hey, the miracles and everything is cool and them Happy Meals you gave us. Yeah, that's all right. But dude, we are Jews. We don't do that. And they straight up walked away from him. And I'm pretty sure a lot of them wanted to stone him. Including people he lived in the house with. Because his brother said, why don't you go to Judea? Where they want to kill you. Now, <laughs> do you think Jesus held a grudge against his brothers and sisters? Now, actually, he just says his brothers did that. Maybe his sisters looked up to him and, and loved him but the competitiveness from boys. I don't believe the Lord held anything against them. Why? Because they didn't know what they were doing. He lived a life of perfect forgiveness. The scripture that talks about him being nailed to the cross says, as they were nailing him to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. Because they don't know where he lived a life of perfect forgiveness. Living our best life, we're trying to live our best life how Jesus lived his life. Two things. Number one, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Jesus had perfect faith. And number two, without forgiveness, your communication is ineffective. Your communication with the Father, the one that you have faith in, is ineffective. And when I say communication, communication is a two-way street. 
Let me tell you, he hears every thought of yours. But do you hear his? Unforgiveness. Let me say this. There are realms, realities, insights, and revelations in God that cannot be reached or received by an unforgiving heart. There are realms, realities, insights, revelations into God that cannot be reached or received by an unforgiving heart. Let me tell you, this is why the Lord told me what he says, son, unless you forgive America, unless you, for, and, and, the, and every day he showed me, and this is my prayer for you, that every day he shows me something that I need to let go. I was having a, a conversation with a friend. You know, uh, w so I went to college in the 90s. And uh, let's say, say Annapolis wasn't always a friendly town. There were times when I would leave the academy in civilian clothes when you had those privileges. And the way... I was treated and the way other people were treated outside of the academy grounds when you were in civilian clothes was completely different than the way you were treated when you were in uniform. Completely different. <laughs> and as I was recounting that story, the Lord said, you got to let that go, son. You got to let it go. I tell you, we'll tell you one of the funny stories. I remember my, uh, my junior year, I, I called and and ordered a, a rental car to go home for a holiday. And so when I got there, I was in uniform. When I got there, I, get, I was in uniform. When I got there, I said, because I, I had called and made a reservation, I said, I'm here to pick up a rental car. The guy threw me the keys and said, okay. I signed no paperwork. He just, he said, hey, here's the car. I took that car from Annapolis to Alabama and back. And when I got back that next week, he goes, thank God you came back. I wasn't supposed to give you that car. But I saw your uniform. I just I had a, a free car for a week. And he said, I ain't gonna even charge you for it, because you brought it back. <laughs> but it was the uniform that threw him off. So he said, hey, you, might, you know, our summer whites. Said, That's the cool uniform. I was like, well, you know, you are walking to a club in that cool uniform, let's tell you. But let's stay on track because if we can go down the road. There are realms that you can't reach from an unforgiving heart. John 16, 13 says this. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Next verse. He will glorify me, and he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Next verse. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. All right. Within context, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Without forgiveness in your heart, your communication will be ineffective. Living our best life as Jesus did. Let me say this. There's a quote from C.S. Lewis that I think pertains to everyone who hears this. Whatever may have been the powers of unfallen man, it appears that those of redeemed man will be almost impossible. And as I'm reading that quote, you see there's a capital M there. Does my lowercase m pull his capital M down, or does his capital M pull my lowercase up? His is greater. So the redeemed man in Christ is almost impossible. Let me tell you, when the Lord says he will take of what is mine and declare it to you, do you know that you, <sighs> I'm, I'm about to step into some uncharted territory, so just bear with me as I wade my way through it. Jesus, conceived by the Spirit, when he walked, he walked in flesh, but there's the Spirit walking in him. I'm, I'm going to try to give you an image of this. Jesus is walking on the water. Peter says, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus says, come. What did Peter walk on? 
I'm going to say he didn't walk on water. He walked on the faith of that word. He walked on the faith of the word. And what Jesus did was he took something that was his and gave it to Peter. When it says that the spirit will take of what is mine and declare it to you. He's going to be declaring to you things which are Jesus's, which will enhance your ability to live an overcoming life. But if your heart is unforgiving, you won't be able to hear it. You guys know I, I love Star Trek. One of my favorite shows, Star Trek The Next Generation. One of my favorite characters on there is a character by the name of Lieutenant Commander Data, or even Commander Data at one point. He is the android. He's the android, right? Now, his creator was another character by the name of Dr. Noonien Soon, who created the heuristic algorithms, he created the positronic brain, he created every piece of code that was embedded within data. And when data met him, and he would start talking, he, he, met, his, he met his father, and he said, I'm so pleased to meet you. And, and you know, Father, I have trouble with this. I have trouble with that. And he would say, data, access subprogram 623B, blah, 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 blah. And data would go, huh? the answer was there. When the spirit takes of what is Jesus and declares it to you, he's telling you to access this part of you. It becomes alive in you. Now you have access to it. It was probably there all the time. You, but what you couldn't do is you couldn't act on it. And it is the unforgiving heart that prohibits that voice from being heard. I'm, he's going to take of what is mine. He's going to take of what is mine. Man be. When those words were spoken, everything that mankind would ever need was implanted in a man, but we lost it. And, and it, is, it, is, it is through the process of unforgiveness, I believe, that we, we've been so separated from it. We can't, we can't even hear come. We can't even hear the come. Jesus was playing out in the physical, when he spoke to Peter to say, come, what he was prophesying right here. All things that the Father have are mine. If all things that the Father has are Jesus, and you is a joint heir with Jesus, what does that mean? All things that the Father has are yours. We just can't access it because we haven't heard the voice. It's there. Just like those subroutines were in Lieutenant Commander Data from the day he was created. Those subroutines, he, number one, he didn't even know where to look. But when he heard the voice of his creator say, look here. When you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit that says, do this. When you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit that says, do that. What is the this and the that? I don't know. But it could be as simple as, come. Do you understand what was imparted into Peter with just that four-letter English word, come? Now, I love science, and I'm thinking that Jesus changed the surface tension of the water, that he changed the physical part. No, he just said, come, and reactivated something on the inside of Peter, which the original man probably had. I, I believe Adam could have walked on water. And it, I think it bears saying, Genesis 3, 2, I believe it is. He created the male and female and called their name Adam. So I believe they, they walked on water. And all of that died when they fell. But when he brought up mankind again, he is, and, and the key to our existence going forward forward is going to be our ability to, to hear the come there's realms how did I write that there are realms realities insights and revelations into God that cannot be reached 
or received by an unforgiving heart. And that is why he wants us to purge unforgiveness from our being. And if you can purge that, and I said if, I, I, when you purge that, it's not, a, it's not an if, but when you purge that, you have just made a, <laughs> Neil Armstrong, one small step for a man, one giant step for a man. When you purge that, you've just made that giant step. Because you have then, that, uh, the, the, the storehouse, the, the key, the, the vault, where everything has been stored up, has been, oh, ooh. Yeah, let's give Sharon the microphone. <laughs> All right. So that's living our best life. The same way that Jesus did it. We live it by faith. And we live it with complete forgiveness in our hearts. If you're black, the historical sins of this country, we got to let them go. If you're Italian, you got to let them go. If you are a woman and have been oppressed by the male of our speech, you, you got to let it go. If you're white or Caucasian, and some of your rights have been trampled because the historical sins are trying to be corrected, you got to let it go. Because when we walk in complete forgiveness, we are able to see this entity, this, this, this spirit-soul-body connection called a man. We are able to see it in the same light that Jesus saw in it. And it is a light that says this is valuable. This is worth my time. This is worth my sacrifice. This is, this is worth something. And when we have that perspective for our fellow man, we are truly walking as God himself. Because he sees such value in the person sitting to your left and to your right. Such value. And just because I'm, I'm saying... That means he sees value in too because you're sitting to the left and right of people. Right, okay, you guys got me. <laughs> Living our best life. Anybody ready to live their best life? Amen. I know we did this last week, but I just, I think it, man, so we're just going to purge all unforgiveness. Father, increase our faith. Father, increase our faith. And turn it all over to him. My prayer for you throughout this week is that he will show you areas that you need to let it go. Because as you start walking in those areas, I'm telling you, the voice, the come. Your word may be just that simple. Your word which heals your family may be just that simple. Your word which propels your career may be just that simple. Your word which starts that business for you may be just that. Your word which allows healing to be manifested in your body because it's just that simple. Come. I've often heard it said in churches that one word from the Lord can change your life. I believe Peter, that example of Peter, proves it. Because I believe that that changed Peter's life. Yeah. Did he stumble? Absolutely he did. But hey, he has the experience of having walked on water. 